and girls, welcome to Riverbend Nature Talks. Today our topic is trees. And did you know that trees are homes to many, many animals? And we're going to look at some of those today. I have a couple of special guests to help me with the program. This is Tex Turtle. And we have the famous Mr. Lorax right here with us today. We're gonna begin by reading one of my favorite stories, The Lorax. So here we go. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Wensler still lives here. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the Wensler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of miff muffered moop. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you perhaps if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lifts down a tin pail and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his grubulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper my phone, for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Schlup! Down schlups the whisper my phone to your ear, and the old oncer's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the Swami Swans rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffula fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffula trees, all my life I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffula tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, 
I took the soft tuft and I knitted at the need. The instant I finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him. That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy. And he spoke with such a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset, and he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of my truffula tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I'm quite useful. This thing is at the need. At the needs, find something that all people need. It's a shirt, it's a sock, it's a glove, it's a hat, but it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers on bicycle seats. The Lorax said, sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool the need. But the very minute I proved he was wrong, for just at that minute a chap came along and he thought that the need I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety eight. I laughed at the Lorax, you poor stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him, be quiet if you please. I rushed across the room, no time at all, built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called on my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen here. Here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunser family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast. Take the road to North Niche. Turn left on Weehawken. Sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunsler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting the needs, just as busy as bees, to the sound of the chopping of the truffula trees. Then, oh baby, oh how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe whacker, which whacked off four truffula trees at one smacker. We were making the needs four times as fast as before, and that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there is not enough truffula fruit to go around. And my poor barbaloots are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried and he sent them away. I, the ones that felt sad as I watched them all go, but... Business is business and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm, I most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads of the, the needs I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to south, to the east, to the west, to the north, I went right on biggering, selling more than needs, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. 
then again he came back i was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance lorax came back with more gripes <laughs> i am the lorax he coughed and he whipped he sneezed and he snuffled he snarled he sniffed once sir, he cried with a crustulous croak once sir, you're making such smogulous smoke my poor swami swans why they can't sing a note no one can sing who has smog in his throat and so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax's dander was up. Let me say a few words about gluppity glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop making gluppity glup. Also schloppity schlop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old Wensler man, you. You're glumping the pond where the hummingfish hummed. No more can they hum for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to do go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm biggering on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more terrafula trees into the needs which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more the needs, no more work to be done, so no time my Uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke smuggered stars. Now all that was left beneath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away through the years while my buildings have fallen apart. I worried about it with all my heart. But now, said the one sir, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch calls the one sir. He lets something fall. It's a trophula seat. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula, treat it with care, give it clean water, 
and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest. Protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all his friends may come back. Okay. So boys and girls, when we are reading through the Lorax, we learn that a lot of animals depend upon the trees, don't they? And so we're gonna look at a few of the animals. Some are very, very small and some are a lot bigger. So here are some of the smaller things. We have the caterpillar from the gypsy moth. We have a red flat bark beetle who comes right in here under the bark of the tree. Sometimes if you're walking along, you can see fungus growing on the tree. Oh, and who's hiding in this little space? Why, it's a chipmunk. Oh, we have a little gray tree frog and a beautiful scarlet tanager. So let's see. Oh, here are some of the bigger animals that live on our tree. So we have all kinds of birds, and we're going to look at some birds' nests, uh, some bird homes in just a few minutes. And we have a beautiful owl. Oh, look, you have a little squirrel. We don't see too many of these around here, but this is a porcupine. Oh, our beautiful woodpecker. And sometimes bees make their homes right in a hole in the tree. Oh, and who's this? Why, this is Mr. Raccoon. Oh, look at our tree. It also has lots of different kinds of vines and vegetation growing on it. Oh, some of our animals are little tiny ones. What's this? Why, it's a deer mouse. Oh, here we have Mr. Fox. He's kind of hunkered down low, close by the trunk in the ground. Oh, here's one of my favorite insects. <laughs> this is a cicada, one, part of one of its life cycle. And here is, you all know what this is. This is an earthworm. And they live around the tree and the soil and help build the soil for our tree to flourish. Oh, look at that. Trees provide food. Look at Mr. Squirrel eating his acorn. And look here, we have a white-tailed deer munching on some vegetation. Oh, and soon we're going to go out and take a little field trip to the garden and see what we can see in the tree. Okay, boys and girls, over here we're going to look at some of the little animals that live in a tree, and some of them are a little bigger and some are smaller. So here we don't actually see the animal, but we see the little tunnels it made under the bark. And then it lays its eggs in here and they'll actually hatch under the bark. So sometimes we don't always see the animals, but we see evidence of them, okay? And sometimes animals love these little holes to, wouldn't that be a nice home, okay? So we're gonna look at some of the animals. We're gonna start with the smaller ones that we might see near our tree. Start with this moth right here. Okay, you all can see that? That's one of our smaller insect friends that lives in the tree. Oh, and one of the pictures that we saw, what did we see in the tree? We saw bees, didn't we? And here's one of my favorites. And when you hear these, it means it's summertime. This is a cicada. And we can find those in the trees, can't we? And sometimes you might not find the cicada, but you might find its shell. You kind of cling to the bark of the tree. Okay, now, 
want you to put your nature detective hats on because I'm going to show you a couple of things and they're very beautiful. And I want you to guess what they are and what they're made out of. Here's one. And here is the other one. Can y'all see? <clears throat> it's very fragile. Can you guess what that is? That's a very small home, isn't it? What do you think would live in a home that small? Oh, you're right, it's a hummingbird. Yes, and now, now is the real question. What are these little tiny nests made out of? Well, these particular ones are made out of lichens and spider web. Isn't that incredible? They're so tiny and so beautifully built and they last a long time. Okay, we're gonna come over here and a lot of the animals that live in the tree make a home that looks like this. And this is an Oriole nest. And you can see that it's beautifully woven together and you can look inside. Wouldn't that be comfortable? And you see that this bird uses parts of the tree to build the nest and to attach the nest to. Okay, now, here's another nest and let's just look at some of the things. This is a Robin nest. And you can see there are some little twigs from the tree and some little pieces of grass. And inside, do you see how beautifully it's sculpted and shaped to make a nice home for the eggs? And this is mud. Okay, now here is a little different one that we don't see too often. We hope we don't see it too often, really. Guess what this one is made out of? Can you see the hole down into it? That's correct. It's made out of fishing line. So <clears throat> birds use whatever they can find to construct their beautiful nests and they're very carefully woven together. Of course, we prefer that the fishing line uh, was properly disposed of, but this is a pretty good use for it. Okay, now we're going to look at a, a little larger bird over here. Can any of you guess what this wing belongs to? That's correct. This is the wing of a barn owl, and owls are amazing. Some owls can hear a heartbeat. Can you hear your heartbeat? I don't, that would be very difficult, wouldn't it? You know, and listen. Do you hear any sound when I move the wings back and forth? No, they have these beautiful little tiny feathers on the leading edge of the wing that helps them to have silent flight. Now, why would that be important for an owl? Well, if they're going down for their dinner, they don't want their dinner to hear them, do they? So for their prey, they need silent flight, and then they'll use their talons to collect their prey. So they have a very good way of um, surviving, okay? And now we're going to go to a couple of little larger animals. And this one is the pelt of an animal. And I'm going to show you the backside because if you look at his tail, I bet you can guess what it is. That's right, it's a raccoon. So we'll see raccoons occasionally near the tree or in a tree. And so keep your eyes open. 
And then last of all, we're gonna look at Mr. Gray Fox here. And Mr. Gray Fox is uh, a fox that can actually climb a tree. Wouldn't that be a surprise? Okay, so these are some of the animals that we see uh, in a tree or around a tree or under a tree. And now we're gonna take our little field trip outside. But in order to do that, for a field trip, we need some tools, don't we? Because we're gonna go out and have a little look here. So I have this bag and you can use any kind of bag. These are simple tools. And first of all, we need some crayons. And make sure all the paper is off of the crayons. And we need some paper. And, oh, we want to take some measurements, won't we? Okay. Oh, here's a tool called a clinometer. Can you guess what that's for? Well, think about it, and we'll talk about it when we get out to the tree. Oh, a ruler is always handy to do a little measurement. Oh, and here's a very important tool. This is a hand lens, and it helps us to take a little closer look at things. Oh, and here's one of my favorite tools. This is called a stethoscope. If you go to the doctor, sometimes you'll see that your doctor uses this. But we can also use it on a tree because a tree has water going up, it has nutrients going down. So there's a lot of movement in a tree and we might be able to hear it with our stethoscope. Okay, so we are ready to go. Hope you enjoyed your little trip out here to the garden. Now, you may not have a big garden, maybe you just have a really special outdoor space. It doesn't take anything magnificent. It can be a very small, special space as long as it's outdoors. So we're gonna look at the parts of a tree first. We're gonna start by just having a little investigation here. You all have your nature detective hats on, right? So we all know what this is called? Yes, that is correct. This is called the bark. And look at this bark, it's kind of rough, isn't it? Well, there are many, many different kinds of bark. Some are very, very rough, and some are very, very big. So you can tell a lot about what kind of tree it is by just looking at the bark. And we're gonna pull out one of our tools in just a minute. And let's look at some of the other parts of the tree. This part up here, what's this called? That's right, that's the branch. These are the branches of the tree. And y'all can tell me what these are. These, of course, are the leaves. 
And this time of year, what color do you see? Up, oh, green. And that's very important, very special. It's that green color and the chlorophyll in the leaf that helps the leaves to make their own food. And they make their food in the leaves and then it's distributed all the way through the tree, through the branches, all the way down to the roots, which we cannot totally see. You can see a few of them above the ground, but most of them are below the ground. Okay, so we have our trunk, our big old trunk here. We have our branches. We have the smaller twigs. We have our leaves. And this is a very special tree. It has something really good that animals love to eat. It's called an acorn. And the acorn is actually a seed. So if you take an acorn, and you put it in the soil and take care of it, it might sprout into a beautiful oak tree. So, and animals, as I mentioned, they love to eat these squirrels, love to eat them. They carry them away and bury them. And sometimes when they bury their acorn, a little oak tree springs up. Wouldn't that be a surprise? So when we look around the ground under our special oak tree, we see a lot of acorns. And remember that an acorn is a seed. And what's inside of a seed? The baby plant is inside of a seed. And this is a baby oak tree that sprouted from one of the acorns. So that's really special, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to do a few little measurements. So now, oh, oh, we're going to go all the way around and measure the circumference of our tree. That's the distance around our tree right here. Oops, we're going to go, here we go. We have, what do we have here? You see it? Now the next tool we're going to use is called a coinometer. And this one requires a little bit of math. We're not going to complete this one, but I did want to show you how it works. So we're going to go about 10 meters out from the tree. Through very special math, we could determine the height of our tree. But we're going to go on and look at some other things. Oh, here was our document. I'm going to put this on. what's going on under the bar. So we're going to step over here for just a minute and look at a tree. Now if I were to cut this tree off right here, I could get a tree slice. And in our tree slice, it tells us a lot of things. It tells us how old our tree is. If you see a light ring and a dark ring together, that's one year. And so you can count those and determine how old our tree is. Now, I was mentioning hearing something flowing up and down the tree. Well, there are different layers. On the outside, you can see our rough layer of bark. And then we have a layer of inner bark called the phloem. And then we have a tiny, tiny 
a layer called the cambium, and that's where new cells are generated. And then we have all this area here called the xylem, and that's bringing up water from the roots to the rest of the tree. And in the very middle, we have the heartwood. And the heartwood, it's really not alive, but it helps to keep the tree standing. So it has a very important job to do. Okay, so that's our tree slice. We're gonna use one of my favorite tools. This is called a hand lens. And when I wanna look at something close up, I can use this tool. And so I'm gonna come over here and have a really close look and see what we can see here. We're gonna see if we can see some critters on here. Oh, oh, I see something really interesting. Did you see it go in the little hole? Let's see what else we can see here. Oh, wow. Looks like a whole new world, doesn't it? Oh, that's incredible. Oh, I'm pretty sure this will be habitat with some kind of critter in there. So you can take your hand lens and go over the whole tree because every part of it is a home or habitat for some little critter, sometimes tiny critter, maybe a fungus even. So that's a really important tool. Now, oh, let's have a little look at a leaf. <gasps> Whoa, look at this. Can you see what I see? Wow, this is a special habitat for a very special little animal, isn't it? Oh, that's incredible. So when you go out in your special outdoor place, make sure and take your hand lens and look at leaves, look at bark, look at roots. Okay. For our project, one of our projects today, we're going to build a birdhouse. And so here are the challenges. We need to go out and collect our own materials. Remember the birdhouses we saw earlier? Remember some of the materials you saw in them? So I've gone out and I've collected some really special sticks. I'm gonna start arranging them. I'm sure I won't do as good a job as a bird does, but we'll see what we can do here. Okay. Remember, this has to hold those special eggs. So maybe I'll put some sticks on the bottom. I'll weave them together a little bit. We want them to stay together, don't we? That one underneath. And then on top, we're going to use some of our grass and some of our leaves to make it so it's nice. And like I said, a bird would do a much better job than I'm doing, but you can see we sort of have the beginning of our little nest here. Okay, so now we have a beautiful little nest. out and build your little nest and if you do and you really like the way it looks take a photo and send it to us and we'll put it in our gallery so everybody can see it okay our second a leaf rubbing so what we're gonna do I'm gonna jump up and for this one, you can get different leaves. We're going to use an oak leaf, but you could try many different leaves, all the different types of trees that you see around you. Uh, for this one, we're going to use our little oak leaf. And there we go. So, this is a crayon rubbing. So we're going to put our little leaf upside down under the paper and we're going to take a crayon and notice the crayon 
I took all the paper off and I broke it in half and that makes it just perfect. Okay, and we're gonna use it the long way and gently go over the whole leaf. Can you begin to see the leaf? There we go. There we go. So when we see our leaf rubbing, we can see the veins of the leaves. We can see the leaf margin or that little edge. So we can tell a lot by just doing the leaf rubbing. And you can also do bark rubbings. Let me show you a picture of a bark rubbing. Here are some more leaf rubbings. So you can use all different kinds of leaves. Let's see if we can find some bark rubbings. Oh, look at this. This is a, a rubbing from bark. So you can put your paper right against the tree and pick some crayons, some colors that you like you're rubbing. So, and if you try it with different trees, you'll get different textures. Okay, and we notice that leaves come in all different shapes and sizes. And if you look at the leaf, you can tell what kind of tree it is. So after you get all of your leaf rubbings, if you do a bunch of them, you can actually cut them out and make little animals out of them or little designs. And I have a picture of one over here. So you can cut your rubbings out and make all sorts of designs with them. And it's a lot of fun and a way to learn. Okay, boys and girls, thank all of you for coming to Nature Tots today. Um, I hope you had a good time and remember always go outside is the place to be thank you